Good afternoon. My name is Michael Montman. I'm a junior pre-medical student studying biochemistry and public health here at Calvin, and I would like to welcome you to the January series 2017. I would also like to extend a special welcome to four of our 50 remote webcast sites. Cary, North Carolina, Fremont, Michigan, San Jose, California, and Redlands, California. Now, if you'll all please pray with me. Good and gracious God, you are known even in dark places. Thank you for giving people the audacity to believe that they can make a difference in those places. Thank you for using institutions like Calvin, which prepare your agents to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Bless our time together and change us through the words of our speaker. All these things we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. And now, Matt Kaczynski, the Director of Media Relations at Calvin, will introduce our guest. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the author writes such things as, Love your enemies. Do to others what you would have them do to you. And if you love only the people who love you, what praise should you get? Even sinners love the people who love them. Today's speaker has taken these words literally to heart. Jeremy Courtney is the founder of Preemptive Love Coalition, a development organization that works in Iraq, providing life-saving surgeries for children, and more recently responding to the daily needs of those living in the shadow of ISIS. For the past decade, Jeremy, his wife Jessica, and their two young children have lived within areas perceived as enemy territory, building relationships with people they were taught to hate, and in the process, being reminded how dangerous our profiles, generalizations, and stereotypes of each other can be, often erasing our shared humanity. They've lived out the motto, preemptive love, the idea of loving first and asking questions later. This leaning in with love has come with death threats and numerous stories of betrayal, but it has also shown the capacity through relationship after relationship to overcome hatred and set wrongs right. Calvin College is grateful to the Howard Miller Company, Gary and Pat Ringnalda, and Samaritus for underwriting today's presentation. Following the presentation, Jeremy will be available in the West Lobby to greet the audience. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Courtney. Good morning. Can I make a confession to start out our time here together this morning after that glowing introduction? Um, I'm afraid, not, not of you guys, um, but just, just in general, like I'm afraid after a decade of living in Iraq and moving in and among places like Syria, after living on the front lines of violence among Sunni jihadist sniper fire and sleeper cells and Shia militia, I'm afraid. Um, I've, I've been moving in and among this conflict. We moved to Iraq in the middle of the Iraq war and I continue to push into these hard places and put my life and my family's life on the line. But it's not easy, it's not simple and it just seems appropriate to kind of start out this morning and say that I'm afraid. I'm regularly afraid. Now, the conversation about fear in America over the last couple of weeks, months, years, maybe it's been going on longer than that, is often very polarizing. When we, when we come to something that we fear, we often go to one side and we get this message that says, be safe, protect our own, be wise, build walls, build doors, build locks. And then on the other side, we have the people who rebel against that and they say, oh, come on, be loving, be compassionate. Where's your heart? I want to suggest that what is most needed is to rise above this dualistic pitting of us versus them, of our security versus someone else's security, of our well-being versus someone else's well-being. 
We rarely, it seems, question this underlying worldview. And so we ask questions and we reach conclusions that have us continually saying, us versus them, me versus you, safe versus love. There is a way to rise above it. What I hope to elucidate here today is is a call, even a way, a process by which we can not keep pinging back and forth between the party lines, between me versus you, but we can actually live on a different level of existence altogether. But it's going to take some ancient wisdom for us to get there. The kind of wisdom, the message, the vision that guided me and my family to move into Iraq in the first place. But you don't know that story yet, so let me start there. I moved to Iraq in the middle of the Iraq War, compelled in many ways by this, um, this set of headlines, this breaking news, this constant story that we were seeing about the bloodletting in and across Iraq, Sunni versus Shia as the civil war reached its peak. Saddam had been overthrown, but democracy had not really come in all the ways that was promised. And so as the American project in Iraq was not going well and Iraqis were killing each other en masse, my wife and me and some others in our community felt compelled by this question, what if we moved into the neighborhood and tried to be a part of the solution? Very early on in my time in Iraq, I was sitting in a hotel. I was minding my business, working on my laptop when this guy approached me and told me about his little cousin. She's about yay big. Um, These are just some photos I'll go through during my time. Um, They're not necessarily tied to any one point here, but um, he told me about his little cousin that was about yay big and said she was born with this huge hole in her heart. And after all these decades of dictatorship and war with Iran and sanctions by the UN and Al-Qaeda targeting our doctors and our nurses, we, Iraq, don't have a doctor or a hospital left in the entire place who can save her life. Could you please, you came here as an American, you came here as a Christian to help us, can you please help my little cousin? And so we threw in our lot with this family to see what we could do to help them and soon became aware of hundreds and then thousands of kids like her and little boys and little girls and older kids who were suffering from these life-threatening heart defects. And we began, began inviting doctors and nurses to brave the bombs and the bullets to come into Iraq and dare to save their lives. But more than just save their lives, to actually invest in the future of Iraq, to help build up the systems of Iraq so that doctors themselves, Iraqis, Iraqi nurses, they would be able to do far more over the next decades than we could ever do for them ourselves. So we trained them and we invested in them and we invested in infrastructure. And this work, serving kids, began taking us to some of the most alarming, scariest places in the country. We were the first Americans to come into Fallujah without guns, it was said. We were in Tikrit, Saddam Hussein's hometown, on the anniversary of his overthrow from power. The very people, his cousins who should have hated us most, we were working alongside them to save their kids' lives. And surrounded by this culture, this conflict, where everyone everywhere seemed to adopt this posture, shoot first, ask questions later. Militias, soldiers, private security, terrorists, shoot first, ask questions later, seemed at times to be the way of the day. We began asking ourselves as a family, as a community, what if there was a different way? What if there was a better way? Bombing these ideas out of existence doesn't seem to be working very well. The more we shoot, the more Al-Qaeda seems to grow. We can drive these ideas underground, but we'll shoot first, ask questions later, actually address our biggest fears. And so we began saying, is this even the way of Jesus? Is there a better way to live? What if we could dare to be a community who would love first and ask questions later? Now, this heart surgery work continued to grow over the years after Fallujah, after Tikrit, Baghdad, Shia areas, Kurdish areas. We worked with the first lady of Iraq. We worked with the prime minister. We worked with the vice president. We had tea with the grand ayatollah of all Shia Islam in his home in Najaf. We had friends on the Sunni side and the Shia side and everywhere in between. And then in the middle of 
this growth, in the middle of our service, in the middle of trying to help people who needed it most, this little known terror organization sprung on the scene in a very big way in the summer of 2014 and overran the city of Mosul. ISIS drives out 30,000 Iraqi, 30, Iraqi soldiers from Mosul. ISIS goes door to door in Mosul and marks the homes of ancient Christians for expropriation, for extermination, drawing on their walls the red letter N, marking them as Nasrani, Nazarenes, followers of the Nazarene, saying, if you Christians want to continue to be a part, be alive in this caliphate, you will either pay a submission tax for being a minority religion, you will convert to Islam, you will leave our caliphate altogether, or if you refuse to do any of those three things, you'll just be killed. And so a mass exodus of Christians from Mosul starts taking place, and then ISIS continues their rampage in nearby areas occupied by small little ethno-religious groups and starts ransacking Yazidi villages and Shabaki villages and Kakai villages and Turkmen villages, rounding up women in mass, incarcerating thousands and thousands of Yazidi girls, turning them into slaves for their own debased pleasures, taking the men of these Yazidi villages and these Yazidi families and killing thousands of men in mass, throwing them in mass graves. And then suddenly now, this many years into it, this love first, ask questions later doesn't have all the same import to it that it did at the beginning because we'd walked a lot of steps by that point. We'd actually asked a lot of the questions by that point. We'd gotten a lot of answers. We now knew what it was going to cost us to continue to love on the front lines as this terrorist group makes its way across the country. And so what we needed most to motivate us in those days was not purely a love first, ask questions later kind of naive mantra, but we needed something that in the face of all this fear, in the face of this terrorist group that was going around beheading anyone, anywhere it seemed like they could find at times, if, using social media to terrorize us as we sat at our computers and watched this thing unfold, what would motivate us? What would keep us going in the face of such fear? Furthermore, our organization wasn't really built to keep going in the face of such fear. It wasn't really built to respond to the needs of the day at that time. We were doing heart surgeries for little babies like this. We didn't know how to provide food for millions and millions of people who were being driven from their home. We didn't know how to come alongside entire communities who had seen all of their family members slaughtered at the hands of ISIS and needed to be helped to stand up on their own two feet again and rebuild their homes and rebuild their communities after this violence made its way through and destroyed property and destroyed entire churches and centers of worship and entire cities. That's a city. That was a neighborhood. We weren't built to respond to this. And so as ISIS is making its way across the country, we had a quick huddle up around the table in our office and said, what are we going to do as this massive humanitarian crisis is playing out around us? Are we going to sit on our hands and say that it wasn't our job? We were a medical organization. We were doing our thing. Or are we going to pivot with the needs of the thousands of people pouring in around us? Soon millions, three and a half some million people ultimately displaced by ISIS in this conflict. Are we going to go to them and learn how to love them in their time of need? That conversation about the future of our organization lasted about 30 seconds, I think, and we decided we have to figure out how to get involved how to pivot from the strengths that we've been building, how to lean on this, this network that we've been building from the Grand Ayatollah to the top Sunni leadership to the Prime Minister's office and the First Lady and the thousands and thousands of those cute little kids that I just flew through all across the country. How do we, how do we leverage all that momentum so that we can serve now in this space? And with those fears banging around in the back of our heads, about the beheadings and the burnings and the kidnappings, 
We had to change our our motivating message. It was no longer going to work to say love first and ask questions later because we had too many questions that we were asking now. And we'd gotten too many answers about what happens when you dare to defy ISIS. And so now, faced with this fear, we had to reorient ourselves as a community and say, when the world is scary as all get out, how Can we continue to be the people of Jesus who will love anyway? We've been testing the limits of our ability to love anyway now over the last couple of years, responding on the front lines, first in to provide food and water and medicine for people who are fleeing conflict. When bombs are still falling and snipers are still sniping, We have reorganized ourselves to be that community that shows up first to provide food on the front lines and medicine on the front lines for those who need it most. And then we've committed ourselves to continue to be the last to leave. Because when towns like this are completely destroyed, someone has to stick around long beyond the first handout of a package of food and has to commit to be there for the long haul to help women get back to work when 50% or more of their men have been slaughtered by ISIS? How do we stay in these communities for the long haul? First in, last to leave. We've been testing the limits, the ability of love anyway on the front lines of Mosul over the last couple of weeks. As I've walked the streets literally with dead ISIS fighters at my feet, our team has been shot at by ISIS snipers somewhere out there on the horizon where you can't quite see where it's all coming from, but you just hear the sniper fire pinging around you as the mortars get closer and closer and you can tell that they're slightly adjusting their instruments to target you just a little bit more mortar after mortar. We've been testing the limits of our ability to love anyway. Over the last 10 years in scary places like Baghdad and Mosul and Fallujah, I've been often asked, how do you do what you do? Or or framed maybe more positively, I'm so glad that it's you doing that. (laughs) I could never do what you do. And I I understand the sentiment. Um, It's often meant to be encouraging. But I have a hard time letting those kinds of statements just stand. Because what it does is it pits that world over there where I'm showing you exotic pictures of tanks and starving people and children in need. It it pits that world over there as drastically different from this world that we have over here. It suggests that what is required over there in that world in Aleppo, Syria, and Mosul, Iraq requires a lot more bravery than that which is required of us to do what must be done here at home today. But are our American streets not also riddled by gangs who prey on the dignity and the honor that young men want to recruit them into violent groups over control of terrain so that a few people at the top can benefit financially from this gang activity? Are our security forces not also threatening the youth of our streets at times by viewing the world primarily through suspicious lenses that pits one group versus another? Has our religion and our power not often made it such that my Palestinian Christian or Syrian Christian or Iraqi Christian friends would actually rather live in the Middle East? surrounded by Muslims, then uproot themselves as Christians and come to America and plant themselves down as brown Middle Easterners in America for fear that they will be treated badly because they look like a terrorist? Have our economic policies and our suspicions about who should be our foreign allies and who should be our foreign friends not driven us into a certain place where we, the people, have actually committed hate crimes against each other in recent weeks, in recent months? Are we not also preventing women from living freely 
when we sanctify a man to be president who says that we can grab women by the genitals and they will let us do whatever we want to them as long as we are rich and powerful and famous? Yeah, life in Iraq, in Syria is different than life in America. But I reject the idea that Iraq and Syria are inherently worse or that it requires more bravery to do what I do over there than that which is required of us here today. The truth is, some of us are far, far more afraid of standing up at church, marching in the streets, losing our job for doing what's right here than we are of bombs and bullets and blood. Willingness to endure bombs and bullets and blood is actually no real measure of love. In fact, I've seen plenty of soldiers, missionaries, aid workers over the year who willingly run into conflict. They are willing to endure bombs and bullets and blood, but we don't all do it from a place of love. I've seen soldiers and missionaries and aid workers run into conflict from a kind of self-loathing. I hate myself. I hate my life. And so let me run toward this thing in pursuit of meaning. Bombs and bullets or blood are no real measure of love. I've seen missionaries and aid workers and soldiers run into these places and be willing to endure getting shot at, driven by fear, driven by hatred for another. And so the exoticness of bombs and bullets and blood are no real measure of love. Love is also not measured by how much we abuse or debase or ignore ourselves on behalf of someone else, on behalf of another. Running myself into the ground, choosing you over me. That's not necessarily love. In fact, it's often just an extension of this zero-sum mentality that says me versus you. That says we cannot both be equally well at the same time. Instead, I would suggest that the truest, the highest love, the love espoused here at Calvin in the life and the death of Jesus is the love that for the joy set before it is willing to endure suffering, even shame. Yes, maybe even bombs and bullets and blood. For the joy, the real mark of love is not found on that spectrum at all of us versus them. You don't have to debase yourself on behalf of someone else, nor debase others on behalf of yourself in order to love. Love realizes that my greatest good is tied up in your greatest good, and your greatest good is tied up in my greatest good, and we belong to each other. We're actually not against one another. And so for my joy, for my well-being, for my happiness, I will endure suffering. I will embrace violence. I will take on risk in order to serve you. Yeah, maybe it will even come to bombs and bullets and blood, but maybe it won't. As long as I know that my well-being and your well-being are intricately tied up with each other. Now, it's true that there's no greater love than putting our lives on the line for one another, but that is not ultimately a message of sacrifice or ultimate loss, but rather a message of ultimate gain. It's not us versus them. It's a reminder that giving our lives away is so ultimately enriching that we cannot lose. The way many of our loudest leaders are leading us right now, we hear most about placing ourselves first. So we can win. It's the kind of winning that's obsessed with other people losing. It's the kind of world that we get when we continue to perpetuate this myth that our only options exist somewhere in this dualistic spectrum of me and you and us and them. The way of preemptive love 
says that if you really care about maximizing your joy, if you really care about saving your life, if you really care about grabbing for yourself all the happiness that you can, give your life away. By laying down your life for others, we all win together, even if we lose everything and die. But how do we actually do it? If, if you buy this message that, that there is a way to live and exist somewhere above the duality that's offered to us, the way most of us live, pinging back and forth between us and them and me and you and mine and yours. If there is a way to get above that while not denying the fear, how do we get there? How do we get beyond this atomized world that we live in today so that we can join in with the renewal of all things? This, this renewal, this kingdom, this well-being, this eternity that we've been reading about and singing about and committing ourselves to ostensibly since our earliest days. I want to offer the um, simple, but sometimes gut-wrenching process that we go through as a family and a community living on the front lines, pursuing peace. And I hope that it'll be helpful to you here in West Michigan or wherever you go or wherever you're watching in the world as you also live on the front lines pursuing peace. First, I want to suggest that we have to face the fear. If we want to get above this this spectrum, this duality, this false narrative of us versus them and rise above that. We have to face the fear. There's a lot of bravado that takes place in the name of love and in the name of security that would have us believe there's nothing to fear at all, right? There's a lot of fear shaming in the world. You've probably been a part of this at some point over the last election cycle on one side or the other. You're afraid of terrorists? Oh, well, you're a racist. You're afraid of immigration? Oh, well, you're a bigot. You're afraid of war? Well, you're a communist. You're afraid of the police? Well, it's probably because you're up to no good. There's a lot of fear shaming. We have so much compassion for children when they're afraid. I've got two kids, nine and 11. I would never treat them like that. I would never wag my finger at them when they articulate their fears, when they dare to be vulnerable and tell me what is concerning them. But we don't extend that same grace to each other as adults anymore. And it's like no one ever told us that as adults, it's okay to be afraid. And so if I can, I just wanna offer that permission to you this morning. That's why I started by saying, I'm afraid. It's okay to be afraid. Because when we don't allow for each other to be afraid, then we put each other in this position where we have to wear these masks and we have to create these policies and these postures and this rhetoric. It kind of struts around with some kind of tough machismo on the one hand or some kind of false self-sacrificial love narrative on the other hand that acts like I have no self-interest and I have to just give myself away because I'm so magnanimous. But both are still just a living between that false dualism. So the first step, I think, for existing above this dualism of us versus them is to just face the fear, own it, name it, admit it, embrace it. I'm afraid. Now what? In our home, in our community, after we've faced the fear, named the fear, we go about counting the cost. Now, FDR famously said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I suspect that's not how you experience fear. I suspect you could list a whole domino set of things that will start tumbling over in your life if one thing happens and then the next thing happens and the next thing happens. You're not just afraid to stand up for the minority at work, or you're not just afraid to stand up against the misogyny that you hear on the street or in the marketplace because of your own ego. At work, for example, you're, you're afraid of rocking the boat. You're afraid of losing that job promotion opportunity. Like me, you might you will be afraid of losing that job altogether. And that's not because you're greedy. You have responsibilities. Either you're a student and you're looking to start a family, 
or you have a family, you've got bills to pay, you've got kids to put through college. And so we get sucked into this this false narrative of us versus them, of choosing my kid's well-being versus somebody else's kid's well-being. Few things seem to elicit more fear these days than conversations about Muslims, refugees, terrorism. On the surface, the conversation is often polarizing because it pits my security against someone else's security. It pits an Iraqi or a Syrian family fleeing violence against the well-being of my kids to walk safely in their own schools. And when we accept that narrative, when we accept that premise, None of us who are loving parents, none of us who are loving brothers and sisters would choose to willingly accept that our own children be killed by terrorism so that someone else can be freed escaping terrorism. So what's needed most is to stop accepting the false narrative that puts one set of kids against another set of kids, that puts one community against another community. After facing these fears and admitting we're afraid, the process that we go through in counting the cost usually involves a couple of questions. Something like, so what? Or then what? I'm afraid letting refugees into this country will allow terrorists to overrun our neighborhoods and spread hate. Okay. Then what? Well, I'm, I'm afraid if they come in and they're spreading hate throughout our neighborhoods that they'll be able to recruit more people. Okay, and then what? Well, I'm afraid that if they recruit more people and create these sleeper cells that they'll be able to actually embark on some kind of attack against our country. I'm afraid that they'll go on some kind of killing spree on a Sunday morning at our church. I'm afraid that they'll start stabbing their way across campus with a single knife that no one detected. Okay, then what? And on and on the process goes in our home in our community, until we get to the bottom of it all. What are we most afraid of? Are we afraid of losing control? Are we afraid of losing identity? Are we afraid of losing privilege? Are we afraid of losing power? Are we afraid of death? And given what we say about our faith, and given what we say about our bravery, and given what we say about our freedom, why is that the case? Now, counting the cost is a two-way street, but we often don't drive on the other side of the road. Um, we really often only engage the conversation as it, as it comes kind of the way I've just framed it, but we don't often engage the other side and say, well, what is the cost of not acting? What is the cost of the alternative action? We spend a lot of time building up these stories of protecting ourselves telling ourselves every kind of story that will kind of silence the alternative voices, but we don't spend a lot of time saying, what is the cost of not acting? What's the cost of not loving my neighbor? What's the cost of not being welcoming? What's the cost of not leaning in to fear? We don't say very often I'm afraid of not letting refugees into this country. I'm, I'm afraid of what that would cause in terms of needless suffering for tens of thousands of people. Or, or we don't say, I'm afraid of the message that I'll send to my kids. If I keep taking them to church every Sunday and reading bedtime stories with them, telling them that we are followers of Jesus, but I model for them something completely different when it comes to this issue or that issue? What is the cost of losing my life? What's the cost of trying to save my life? What's the cost of giving it away? What's the cost of trying to protect it? We tend to play up these benefits. We play up these stories that tell us that if we can just build something secure enough, if we can build a secure enough policy or a secure enough wall or buy enough locks for our doors, that we'll all be well. But we don't really spend enough time exploring that other side. 
We tell ourselves that at the end of the day, that widow or that child on the other side of the world or, or that veteran right there at the street corner who fought and bled and nearly died for me, who's begging for change, that at the end of the day, they're not my people, not my religion, not my color, not my family, not my problem. And I'm here to tell you, insecurity, injury, even death, these are far, far from the worst things that can happen to us. Far worse to live a damnable life than to lose your life for love's sake and find it. Counting the cost helps us find that love that leads to death and that death that leads to life. And so in our family and in our community, after we've named the fear and faced the fear head on and not tried to punch fear in the face, but embraced it as a reality that we'll never be able to fully get rid of, and as, as we've counted the cost and acknowledged the thing at the bottom of it all that scares us most, we commit ourselves to take one step toward the fear and then another. It's not reasonable to think that we can get from 9-11, the very first day that many of us ever started thinking about Islam and terrorism, all the way to providing millions of pounds of food on the front lines in Aleppo and Mosul. That's just not how the world works. We don't microwave these kinds of changes. We don't microwave these kinds of journeys. It's one step faithful after another. We spend a lot of time and effort not facing our fear, not counting the cost. We don't like to admit that we're afraid. It's easier to attack others than it is to admit that our policies and our rhetoric and our votes, our parenting decisions, our theology are often driven by fear. But when we want to build a house, we're very good at sitting down and mapping out all the costs of that house. When we want to send our kids to college, we're very good at projecting out what that's going to cost for us. We take our families to church each Sunday and we say we belong to Jesus. But the truth is we have often not taken stock of the cost. We know the cost of retirement. But we don't know the cost of truly living. We spend a lot of time trying to avoid pain, trying to go around fear. But my experience suggests that fear is a bloodhound and it will stay on your tail. If you try to outrun it, it always catches up. So outrunning, denying, Fear, pain, discomfort, like these are not real options for us. No matter how much we've built our lives to kind of minimize pain and discomfort, these things are always going to be with us. Instead, I want to suggest that we have to actually pass through the fear. Fear is actually the way. If we want to rise above fear, if we want to rise above that duality, of us versus them. We have to actually step toward the fear, step into the fear, pass through the fear, and it will usher us into a whole other way of living. Where we're not fear-free, we're just not fear-bound. Again, this journey that we've been on, these photos and all that they represent going through these communities that that have needed so much from us and these communities that we've been able to serve in so many ways, um, these are not steps that were taken lightly. And it wasn't really a, a sprint. It was something that we just did one step after another. After 9-11, we took one step toward Muslims, afraid. And then some years later, we took one step and moved into the Middle East, really afraid. And then we took one step closer a couple years later and moved into Iraq in the middle of the war, terrified. I didn't go to Fallujah until the war was technically over. And now today we're on the front lines in Mosul, in Fallujah, in Syria, when bombs are still falling and snipers are still sniping, but these things happen one step at a time. And so it's not reasonable for you to think that you'll make it from wherever you are today to full engagement with that person 
or that issue or that community that scares you most. And you don't need to try and cover all that ground today. The importance, the emphasis on this for me is one step after another. Face the fear, count the cost, and take one step toward it. Now, when I stood on this stage four years ago, I asked, how will those of us in this room invest our lives for the people of Syria? I'd been to Baghdad, I'd been to Fallujah, but Syria still like struck terror in my heart. I didn't know anything about Syria. But as this humanitarian crisis was growing, I knew that I needed to somehow goad myself into action. I needed to take that one step closer to Syria. And so I said in front of you as a way of kind of goading myself, coaching myself, urging myself on, how are we in this room going to devote ourselves to the people of Syria? Some months later, we took another step in and started risking our lives alongside the people of Syria. Caught between airstrikes above and terrorists on the ground, some 1,500 different militias in Syria vying for control of terrain, various governments and coalitions on the, on the one side trying to overthrow the Assad government, on the other side trying to overthrow the terrorists and the rebels. And in that time now, we've committed ourselves to loving on the front lines of Aleppo, Damascus, and Idlib and wherever the violence is to keep showing up. Today, right now, today, we'll feed 50,000 people in and around Aleppo. And then tomorrow, we'll feed 50,000 again. And the next day, we'll feed 50,000 again. We're actually in the process of buying five ambulances to travel and move around Aleppo, providing health care to people fleeing violence, delivering babies, providing medicine to those who need it most. We're in the process of building out five medical clinics to do the same in just a larger capacity and more fixed positions. We're creating jobs, building bakeries, putting plumbers and electricians and all these kinds of people back to work, helping people come back to Aleppo. If you look at some of these photos, I mean, Aleppo is just destroyed. Um... I didn't get it, obviously. But, you know, Aleppo right now is, is kind of in this state where there's not, a, there's not a building that hasn't been marked by violence. There's not a building that doesn't have its windows blown out and its doors blown off. And so helping people come home by rebuilding their homes and building some safety for them and some security for them so that they can start living in community again and putting Aleppo back together. These are these just one steps after another, after another that we've been undertaking since I stood on this stage before you four years ago and kind of dared you and me together to invest our lives for the people of Syria as well. And walking through that fear, I've just seen time and time again that we don't have to, we don't have to choose between my security and someone else's security. We don't have to choose between my well-being and someone else's well-being my team, my wife, myself are all convinced that if we are shot and killed on the front lines of Aleppo or Idlib or Mosul or Fallujah tomorrow, it will not be some great loss to the world. And it won't be some great loss to me because I have pursued and maximized my joy and my meaning and my purpose by doing it this way. And so even if I lose my life in pursuit of this great goal, while serving someone else and helping them pursue their greatest good, we all actually win together, even if we lose it all. I don't want to live in a world that seeks to subdue everybody else by power so that I win and they lose. I don't want to embrace that posture that says, shoot first and ask questions later. I've seen violence unmake the world around me in Iraq in Syria and the U.S. And I'm here to tell you today, preemptive love unmakes violence. Preemptive love is the way that we join with God in the renewal of all things. There is a love big enough to change a nation. There is a love big enough to make America great again, big enough to make Syria awesome, big enough to put Iraq back together, big enough to even conquer our own hearts. And it's the love 
that strikes first. So when the world in front of you today and tomorrow is scary as hell, I want to encourage you to love anyway. Thank you. I'm Karen Salpi from the Calvin English Department. Uh, I'm fighting a cold, so I hope you give long answers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's never been a problem. <laughs> Our first question, and you're pointing toward this, is how do we interact with people who love the very thing we're afraid of? How do we love the people who love the very thing that we're afraid of? It's a very interestingly worded question. Mm -hmm. I, don't, um, I don't know that I've ever heard the question posed that way before. Uh, I, mean, I, th I think you're talking about disarming hatred through love. And I like to think that that, that will work. That doesn't seem to be ISIS's official policy. Are you seeing progress? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the fundamental thesis is still has to be my answer, one step at a time, that, that none of these things, if, if we are a people of faith, none of these things are ultimate. None, none, the person in front of me is not, not in process. The person in front of me is in process every bit as much as I am in process. I'm not the person today that I was four years ago when I was on this stage. I won't be the person tomorrow, perhaps, in some ways, that I am today. And so if we are shifting, growing, evolving, maturing, dematuring people, however one says that, devolving, um, then that's actually probably our, our point of greatest hope. Because groups like ISIS, ideologies like ISIS, or whatever the equivalent would be in my own life or on our own side, these are these are pliable, these are malleable, and I believe that the greatest lever we have to move these things is the lever of love. What have you learned about the action and meaning of love from other faiths and worldviews in Iraq in an interfaith organization? Hmm. Yeah, we've learned a tremendous amount from, on the one hand, uh, let's say our Christian brothers and sisters who come at Christianity from a different uh, vantage point in some ways than, than we do. I mean, we have... I come from an evangelical background myself. We have evangelical Christian friends in Iraq, but the predominant group of Christians in Iraq are more of the ancient uh, Christian faith, Chaldean, Syriac Orthodox. Um, their ways, their liturgies, some of the, the orientation and the way that they think about the world is slightly different than mine, and it's different than what I inherited as a so-called Christian in America. So this idea that like Christianity covers all or that Christianity is a monolithic thing in all places, I think I've had, to, I've had to relinquish control of that, that somehow I know explicitly and exclusively what Christianity is, or that I have the corner on it, or that I get to define it even. Um, and so if that's true for my own faith, if that's true for the, the faith that I know so intimately and know so well, how could that not also be true for Islam, for example? I don't know Islam as well as I know Christianity. It's not, it's not truly my own in the way that Christianity is my own. And I've also found it to be wildly diverse and, and existing on a whole spectrum of thought and ideas and posture and practice. And so um, our orientation has not to be... Uh, what one might call a Christian organization, if that means that we lock others out who don't espouse our faith belief or, or are willing to sign on this uh, statement of faith or doctrine, but to be more of a faith community where we welcome in people from all kinds of faith. And we, the, the main operating uh, principle is that the one thing you can't do is you can't check your faith at the door. Don't, don't be secular. Don't, don't make this, don't try to make this a place where faith is not welcome. You can't live this kind of life that we're seeking to live if you're not animated by some kind of faith, 
that things can get better. And so bring that faith in, whether it's Muslim faith, whether it's Yazidi faith, whether it's Christian faith of one stripe or another, you better bring all yourself and all your faith to the table. And let's let our faith inform, engage, challenge, refine each other so that, so that we come out on the other side truly sanctified and truly saved. Two related questions, I think. One from a student, one from an audience member. First, you said that we need to pass through fear. Are there specific ways that you have faced your fears as it relates to facing violence during work in the Middle East? And, um, and the other question is, what would you say to an American Iraqi war veteran struggling with PTSD? Have you experienced similar? Yeah, so I'll start with the first one, um, which was? Um, <laughs> Uh, specific ways that you faced, faced fear. specific fears, yeah. maybe. Uh, in a conversation earlier this morning in one of the classes, I, I was challenged with a similar question that, that caused me to take stock in a way that I, I guess I hadn't quite in some time. And what I, what I was kind of moved in my own reflections this morning was that um, facing fear for us, I guess, has, has largely been about the unknown, when, when our team is literally getting shot at or when you, you literally hear bombs falling just a couple of streets over or, or you're rolling through town and you know that there are ISIS guys just a couple of streets away and there's a dead ISIS guy at your feet. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the bullet that just pinged on the gate beside you that scares you. It's, it's the next bullet that's coming. It's not, it's not the bomb that just fell, it's the next bomb. It's not the ISIS guy that, whose truck just drove by, it's what if there are more and what if they kidnap me and then what? It's, I don't know if you can feel the nuance that I'm trying to tease out here, but it's the, it's the unknown. It's always that future. It's always some one step out ahead of what I can grasp or put my hands on. And so I think for us, the the bravest moments or the facing fear moments that are, that are most intense aren't actually on the battlefield, so to speak. They're actually probably more like in the office when we're mapping out the plan to go into the neighborhood that was just liberated from ISIS control, but we know ISIS is just a couple streets over and we've never been there before. We don't know the community organizer in that area. We don't know quite how intense it is. We've heard all the reports. We've seen all the video. But it's actually still completely foreign to us to go into Fallujah, to go into that part of Mosul, to go in that part of Aleppo. It's the, it's the complete unknown and unknowingness about some of this stuff. That's when we have to face our fear. That's that's when we have to go through this little matrix, this face the fear, count the costs, and then step toward it. And so in the moment of greatest fear, do we dare get in the car, start the engine, and drive the next block toward the thing that scares us most? And if we do drive the next block, then at that next checkpoint, do we dare drive to the next checkpoint, and so on and so forth. So I think that in my experience, it's not like an action movie. It's not like there's, there's no like great, let's go get them speech that happens when certain things are playing out in the field. It, it's like more the mundane, back in the office, quiet staff meeting kinds of times where it's like, so are, are we going to do this? Uh, do we, do we want to step toward that fear? Or do we just want to kind of close the portfolio, all this cool stuff that we've done in the past and say, I think we've done enough this time. So... Back to the question about maybe advice for a victim of PTSD, um, I'm sensing that part of what helps is, is really talking through the experience with others who've shared it. I, do you, yeah, do absolutely. You have I mean, being in a community that generally sees the world the same way and wants to pursue that is one of the most, as I understand it, I didn't serve in that capacity, but as I understand it, it's one of the most exhilarating and exciting things about being a soldier on our side of things, it's one of the most exciting and exhilarating things about doing what we do. Is that we're in this together. Um, when you are then separated from that community, when you're separated from that mission, when you're separated from that thing that has driven you for so long, I, I know people on all sides of these kinds of conflicts who feel unmoored and lacking the community, lacking the camaraderie, lacking the purpose, and lacking the, the people who alone can understand what you've been through. 
it, it can be extremely disorienting. So how, how to find our way back to either that precise community or kind of an alternative community with an alternative vision perhaps or an alternative um, way of processing the world has been what I've seen be most effective in the lives of my, uh, my friends who have served in that way. Um, but, but I think perhaps as much as anything, it's just very important that we, we talk, that we encourage people to talk, that we make it okay for our veterans to not be okay, that we don't turn a blind eye from, from the horrific services and status of life that so many veterans return home to. Uh, we have at times in our country's histories loved our wars and loved the polarization of security versus whatever else exists on the other side, but we really have too often not been patriotic enough to love it all the way to the finish line and to take care of those who have gone out and done the very thing that we asked them to go out and do. So I think there's, it's not just on them to kind of figure out how to come home and be well. It's on us to figure out how, if we're going to continue to be committed to this foreign policy or that, and if we're going to continue to send people into war, then how do we build every possible help system, safety net, cushion, service for them on the backside so that they can come home as well as possible. If you experience a calling to engage in a potentially dangerous community, whether here, or in the, here in the States or abroad, how do you convince those who care about you to support your calling, especially if they fear for your safety? I generally... Um, embrace this posture that what other people think about me is none of my business. Um, <laughs> if, you know, I mean, on, in all seriousness, uh, we can get massively bogged down and, and spin our wheels and, and spend a lot of energy trying to manipulate, change, control what other people think or feel as it relates to us and our life and our mission and our work and our convictions. And that, that goes both ways. I mean, um, people are right to respond to me that way as well, in as much as I'm trying to convince you of something today. Um, of course, we are all bound up in one another. Of course, what I do affects other people. But if it reaches the point where I have a conviction about something, then at least the way I'm built, I, I have to pursue that conviction to its uttermost or, or I will cease to be well on some level. And so, um, thankfully, the truth is I haven't really been surrounded by people who have been very uh, combative, but I do, know that, um, I do know that's a reality for a lot of people. I know that's a reality for a number of people in our community, uh, in our coalition. Like, you reach a level of adulthood and you can sit out and make your own decisions, but it doesn't mean you don't constantly live with the nagging of spouse or brother or sister or parents or friends. And so, um, I guess, we generally take an educational posture more than trying to engage at a combative level, but that can be really difficult, especially if it's family, mm -hmm. because we're, we're far more prone to, to fight with our family and take an aggressive posture and feel like we're being put upon and, and belittled when it's our family. But, but at the end of the day, I guess after we've tried to educate and tried to, to stipulate the world as we know it, um, we ultimately just have to release people to their own convictions and and ask people to release us to our convictions. I will say, if you're a Christian, or, or a Muslim, I guess, in many ways, I mean, both of our faith, Jew, Christian, uh, Muslim, and others, are all actually often putting forward these ideas that the worst thing that can happen to us is not death. Right. Um, and that the most, the thing that is enjoined on us the most is to love to the uttermost. And so I think I have found it helpful at times to just ask family, friends, like, well, what did you think we were talking about when we said this prayer or sang this song or recited this liturgy? What, what did you think it was going to result in if not the ultimate laying down of our lives for another so that we could maximize our joy in this world? If several questions, especially from students wanting to know how we can support or get involved in the Preemptive Love Coalition. So let's end with that question. Yeah, I think the most important thing that I would love to leave you with and just empower you toward is if you want to get involved, get involved locally. 
Um, take this message of preemptive love and do something with it in your own community. This isn't really just about Syrians or Iraqis or refugees or aid or, or development. It's really about how we live here in our own streets, with our own people, with those who are coming to us that we need to be hospitable toward. So that's the first and foremost thing. If you're not willing to engage on some level locally, then we really don't have a place for you internationally. Um, but if you, if you care and are, you're engaged at home and you want to engage at a, at a larger level, the single greatest thing you could do for us at this moment is to sign up to be a monthly supporter of our work. When we say that we want to be first in and last to leave, when we say that we're going to keep going into hard places like Aleppo and Mosul and Fallujah when the bombs are falling and snipers are sniping, and we want to stick around for the long term and help rebuild these destroyed cities, like there's always money for the emergency stuff. As long as CNN and Fox are showing it on the news, like we don't we, we do a pretty good job raising money. The hard thing is getting people who are willing to stick with us for the long haul and be last to leave. And so monthly sponsors, whether you're giving it $5 a month or $500 a month, are the people who help us make long-term projections so that I can walk into that city and say to the mayor, we're going to help you bring back factories. We're going to help you stand up on your own two feet again and provide jobs for your people and help you rebuild life here. I, I can't do that if I don't know what CNN headline news is going to be showing in 2018. But I do know it if we've got a whole room full of people who have said, I can give $5 a month. I can give $500 a month and we'll stick with you until we've rebuilt that city, until we've helped bring about peace in Syria. Jeremy will be out front to greet you afterwards. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being with us. Thank you guys.